Okay, I know. I might be the last watch YouTuber on Earth to make a video about the Omega Seamaster Diver 300. I'm a little bit late to the party, and it feels like it's all already been said before. But after spending some real time with the Seamaster, I feel like there's a lot of things that reviewers miss about this watch. So many hidden treasures and little awesome nuggets. So we're going to be looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly of the Omega Seamaster, and I'll be sharing some of my personal thoughts as well. If you're new here, hi, my name is Brittany, and on this channel, we just talk about watches. I'm currently recovering from jaw surgery, so if you're wondering, why does this girl mumble so much? That's why. But you didn't come here to listen to my post-op updates. Let's talk about the Seamaster. So this is the modern version of the Omega Seamaster Diver 300, and I've got this watch on loan from the fabulous people over at Watchfinder. If you've been looking for a Seamaster, you can buy one from them, and they have a great selection of Seamasters, including my personal favorite and the one I would buy, the pre-ceramic mid-size Seamaster to live out my full Brosnan Bond era fantasies. Thank you, Watchfinder. So when it comes to Seamaster reviews, it's all pretty predictable. One, talk about the specifications. Two, James Bond. Three, talk about coaxial. Four, whinge about the bracelet. Five, really whinge about the helium escape valve. Six, complain about the thickness. And at some point, talk about how pretty the dial is. That's the magic formula. That's the secret sauce. We're gonna be doing some of those things, but as a disclaimer, I won't be talking about James Bond. This is not because I'm unaware that this watch is in James Bond movies. It is more because I don't put too much stock into the fashion sensibilities of fictional spies. Looking at the specifications and wearability, this watch has a case size of 42 millimeters, a lug to lug of 49.7 mil, and a thickness of 13.5 millimeters. On the wrist, I am sized out of this one. So here it is on my five and a half inch wrist versus my husband's six and a half inch, but he keeps insisting that it's six and three quarters inch. But Hagrid, there must be a mistake. This is platform nine and three quarters. I find the Seamaster size really tough to discern if it's too large for me or not. There are times where I look at this one on my wrist and think, hmm, maybe I can pull this off if I'm going for like an obnoxiously big look. But when I come back to my senses, I know it is ultimately too large for me. I think this one looks great on my husband's wrist and I would recommend this for a six and a half inch wrist and up. I know a lot of people complain about the thickness and I know by the measurements it sounds massive, but it really isn't as thick as it sounds. It isn't a thin watch by any stretch of the imagination. It has some presence and feels like a chunky tool watch. The Seamaster has 300 meters of water resistance, date function, and a manual helium escape valve. Inside this watch is the Omega Caliber 8800 coaxial movement, approved by Metas, resistant to magnetic fields reaching 15,000 gauss. Very impressive stuff. Awesome specifications. So now that we're all singing off the same hymn sheet, let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's start with the good. In my humble opinion, the Seamaster Diver 300 is the most interesting and best value mid-tier dive watch that you can buy. And I really mean that. I'm not being hyperbolic. You can think you're all edgy in the comment section and say, Oh, but what about the 50 fathoms, Brit? But no, you're wrong. Now, don't get it twisted, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the 50 Fathoms isn't awesome. I'm just saying it's not as interesting looking as the Seamaster. Aesthetically, I think this is the most beautiful and interesting dive watch. The wave dial motif scalloped bezel that flows into the liar lugs. The design feels almost fluid, and I truly don't think we talk about Omega lugs as much as they deserve to be talked about. There's this nice contrast in the case and on the lugs of polishing and brushing. I particularly love the brush sides to hide away the inevitable scratches that will come as you wear a watch. Last thing I love about the design is the dial layout. The dial feels quite deep and I love the interest in the wave dial and the little pops of red. If you're going to insist on having a date on a dive watch, have it neatly tucked away like they've done with this model. Everything about this design is just masterful. 
and it's not just aesthetically pretty. It has a great movement, beefy specifications, and a lot of the tool features I look for in a dive watch. One big reason to choose an Omega is because of their movement technology. I've talked about the coaxial escapement a few times, so if you want to hear more on that, I will link it in one of the corners now. But if you're really into movement technology and innovation, Omega's doing some exciting things. The Seamaster Diver is also super user friendly, so to set this watch, you just unwind the crown. Position 1 is to wind the watch. Position 2, if you rotate the crown towards you, it sets the date. And crown position 3 is hacking seconds and time setting. Another feature I'm always looking for is some bracelet micro adjustments. It's all fun and games until it's a hot summer's day. You're starting to puff up, you can feel it, and you have no on the fly adjustments. Ugh. So the Seamaster offers comfort setting, giving you some micro adjustment and a diver's extension. Bellissimo, makes me so happy. Okay, let's talk about some of the bad things now. And there's only one thing I would say that is out and out bad about the Diver 300. And that's the bezel action. Like, what the fuck is this Omega? I feel like I'm the only person on YouTube who's outraged about this. Unacceptable. Okay, moving on to the ugly, which is just things that I subjectively like less about this watch. They might be the very things that you love about the Seamaster. So number one, the manual helium escape valve. This one is always deeply divisive. I know there's a lot of people who love the helium escape valve. It does add a tooly charm to the watch, but I don't like it. It is a Seamaster distinctive. There is no getting away from it. It's just not my favorite. Next thing is the bracelet. And this is another one of those things that I know some people love. And it's once again, an Omega distinctive, but I really think the bracelet lets us watch down. It feels like the case is so well constructed and beautiful and fluid. And then it hits this blah bracelet. It feels very 90s in a bad way. I would love it if they reverted back to the reference 225450 bracelet, far more simple design, and give it a slight taper. It would be game over. It'd be so good. It's becoming increasingly apparent to me as this video goes on. I just want the Seamaster to be the 225450. <laughs> hey guys, editing Brittany here again. Uh, I started this video by complaining that all watch reviewers say the exact same things. And I went on and all my complaints are the exact same thing. So there's other things I was trying to get out, but I should have said it in the video. So for one, I feel like I always have conflicting thoughts about the helium escape valve. So I put it under the ugly, but now I'm looking back at my B-rolls and thinking, it doesn't look that bad. I kind of like the asymmetry of it all. I don't know. Two, I feel like it is the watch that you see out and about the most. So if I am to see someone in Bristol, so the city where I live, wearing a mechanical watch, it's probably a Seamaster. And you might not see it more or less than other watches. I just think the bracelet makes it so identifiable that you can just spot it from a mile off, you know? Three, I can't believe I forgot to say this in the video, but Bark and Jack has a video. Um, Adrian Barker, hold on. Adrian Barker has a video about the, oh, what's it called? The crystal. The anti-reflective coating. The anti-reflective coating on his kind of getting scratched on the outside and him not liking it that much. Obviously, I've not experienced that with the watch I have in from Watch Finder, but it might be something you experience and something to be aware of is the anti-reflective on the outside and the inside of the crystal. Is there anything else I missed? This video is so out of order. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. What a mess. But in all seriousness, I have a massive soft spot for the Seamaster. And I think this year is going to be a really big year for the line. So the Seamaster is the longest running product line still produced by Omega. It was first introduced in 1948 to celebrate Omega's 100th anniversary, and it was an immediate bestseller. The Seamaster of then looked very different to how we think of the Seamaster now. 
It wasn't until 1993 that the Seamaster Diver 300 had a bit of a remodel, a bit of a facelift, to start looking as we know it today. The wave dial was added, helium escape valve, and skeletonized hands. And I reckon this year, 2023, is going to be a massive year for this model, with the Seamaster line celebrating its 75th anniversary and the Diver 300 turning 30. So I'm just waiting with anticipation to see what Omega releases later down the line this year. But anyways, I've talked long enough. If you like this video, give it a like, subscribe to my channel, do it right now, and um, let's thank the patrons. Ooh, thank you patrons, thank you patrons, yeah. Thank you patrons, pop tier patrons, but all tier patrons, but most notably, pop tier patrons. Thank you.